This is the 2.5, Conversations Connecting Innovators. My name is Klaus. Ever wondered how an innovation culture is being built and sustained over a long time? In the world of innovation, my guest today, Paul Akers, is a star in his own right. He's an entrepreneur, author, teacher, and a lean maniac. His podcast, YouTube channel, and books have been watched, heard, and are read by millions. He has his very own way of building and, more importantly, sustaining his business. Paul is very intense about lean principles, which he applies to the business world as well as his private life. It helped him to build a company with sought-after products for woodworkers as well as train for two Iron Man runs in his 50s. Paul sat down for a conversation with me, an opportunity which I enjoyed tremendously. Paul Akers, the American innovator, welcome to the 2.5. All right. I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. Um, and I know you speak some German, so so if I don't really know the English words, I will. <laughs> Ambition. My Deutsch is nicht good, but I love speaking it. <laughs> but uh, so, so how come you speak German? Because I went to school in Germany Uh, when I was in college in 1980, there was an abroad program. I had a professor named Dr. Reinhard Fuss in the United States, and he was from Germany. He got his uh, PhD in literature, German literature, and he offered an abroad program. So I studied German in order to participate in that. So I went to school in Germany for one semester, and I fell in love with Germany, the culture, the way of thinking. And I came back and named my first company, Genauer, even though it's not technically correct, European Cabinets, because I started building European Cabinets in the 80s when nobody in America was building them. So uh, the Germans influenced me a lot. Wow. So do you have like any favorite German food or place or whatever you, you, you like to look back to? Oh my gosh, I have so many. Uh, well, I love schnitzels. So much. I love to go. To, I love to go to Nur I love to go to Nuremberg and eat the little. I think we call them schnitzels. I don't know. I, I don't know the correct name for them, but I love to eat that. And I love Nuremberg. I love Heidelberg. I love Nordwanstein. I love Munich. I, I I mean, I've been everywhere in Germany. I, I spent more time in Germany almost in the United States. So I know it backwards and forwards and every inch of it. It's beautiful. I love wandering just through the countryside off the freeway. I'm just wandering and meandering. Uh, it's beautiful there. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but we uh, I'm hosting uh, this podcast uh, in the state of Baden-Württemberg, which is uh, just uh, ah. next to Bavaria. Can you pronounce Baden-Württemberg? Baden-Württemberg. Oh, great. Is that right? Yes. Baden-Württemberg. And Baden-Baden ba ba is one of my most beautiful cities in the world. You know you know the city, yes? Yes. It's like a – isn't it like a capital or – it's not a – is it a capital or – I know it's not the capital. I know Berlin's the capital, but isn't it the capital of the state, state or no? It is actually very, I, I, very close to where where I I live, um, and it's uh, close to the Black Forest. And it used to be right. uh, some years, some hundreds of years back, it used to be some sort of capital status because the the um, like the Dukes of Baden uh, started out from Baden Baden. <laughs> Long. Right, it's one of the wealthiest places in Germany. I know that, correct? Yes, if you have something yeah, yeah. aching, you go to Baden-Baden, and you, there's water that cures yeah, yeah. everything, basically. And, and I've been in the hot springs there, and the spas. It's beautiful. I love it. Okay, great. Well, yeah, thank you, uh, Paul. Having a conversation with you uh, is a real treat. You're doing a lot of videos. You're doing a lot of podcasts, uh, you're doing a lot of uh, blog posts. I have counted more than 1,600 videos on FastCap, which you yeah. didn't create all by yourself. There's other authors right. also. Uh, you have like right. more than 800 videos on your website, on your YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and uh, you have mm -hmm. created more than 500-ish episodes of the American Innovator podcast. Right. Wow, that many. I didn't even know that. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. So you don't need much sleep. Well, 
Uh, I do. You know, I get about eight hours of sleep every night. I'm just very intense and very deliberate about what I do every day. I'm very organized in the way I do it. But most importantly, my, the practice of lean and the implementation of eliminating waste out of my life allows me to get done three, four, five times more than the average person. If you hang around with me, you go, how did you do all that? And the answer is because I took time to slow down, fix all the processes that I was engaging on a daily basis so I could work in flow. And that's why I get so much done. And it appears like I'm living four lifetimes in one, but I'm really not. I'm just using my brain. Okay, so it's not a Jedi trick. It's, uh, it's organization. Nope. It's continuous improvement. It, it is. And, you know, the funny thing about this, Dr. Reichen, that I was going to say was, you know, most people think that the key to success is being really smart, you know, or having advanced degrees and all that other stuff. And it really is not. Life is so simple. It's unbelievable. But most people like to complicate things. So I, my whole persona, my whole concept in life is how do you simplify things so that everyone can access it quickly and easily and this is my mantra in life the way i approach it okay so what what you're saying is that there is something that you do but that's also affecting others that's also uh, asking something from others also Uh, to support you here or to, to do it the same way so you can work uh, well together, for example. Right, right. Well, I definitely am very deliberate too as well about the people that surround me. So I don't, this may sound very harsh, but I don't associate with people that are not passionate about continuous improvement. So nobody works for me in my company. I don't hang around with people, my friends, everyone is passionate about continuous improvement because if they're not, they drag me down. And most people tolerate a lot of low-level performance from the people in their sphere of influence, and I don't. And that's a very unusual characteristic. Okay. Is that, is that helping you, uh, creating friendships? Everyone wants to be my friends. I have thousands of friends all over the world. I answer 300 communications every day. I've already answered ones from probably 15 countries this morning. Everybody wants to be my friend. Everybody wants to come <laughs> into my, my, my universe. But I don't let you in unless you're passionate about continuous improvement. And you said that very clear in your uh, various videos that you uh, uh, put out there uh, showing your, your company. Uh, you said... You're welcoming people, but uh, you have to be on a certain level to understand uh, also the improvements that you've made, the accomplishments that you have made in Fast Cab. That's right. Because here's what happens. So everybody looks at what we're doing and says, oh, that, that would be great to be that way. But we can't do that because we're, we're German or we're Americans or we're from Brazil and our culture doesn't support that. And I just go, get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. You're full of you're full of excuses. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. It's all up here. The minute you say, I'm going to improve, I'm going to eliminate waste, and I'm going to solve the problems that I'm responsible for, not say, oh, I can't do it because Bob or Mary or Gretchen doesn't want to do it. You have a sphere of influence. You need to work on your sphere of influence and forget about everyone else. And that is the correct attitude. And those are the people I'm looking for to bring in and say, okay, let's work together. Does that help you to grow yourself? Oh my gosh, I'm challenged nonstop. I mean, every day is literally a tsunami of change for me. I mean, just today, what we're, you know, we've been doing lean for 21 years. We have the biggest companies in the world come here all the time. Amazon's here all the time. The U.S. Navy's here. Boeing's here. Bombardier's here. You couldn't name Toyota's here. Everybody comes to Fast Cap to learn from us. And yet today we're going through one of the biggest transformations. Just today, implementing one of the biggest changes we probably ever made in the history of our company. 
because we're growing nonstop. It's just it's endless what we're learning. I have um, seen that you you very open to new ideas uh you're open to your own ideas you 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 are open to external ideas you ask people for ideas you support people that have ideas um but some people say um you only learn great things uh by mistake and i was wondering when i read about you about the first fast cap Was that a mistake? Did you screw up really badly in your wood workshop so that you had to fix something very quickly? Oh, very good point. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, I'm sure I was covering a defect. Yeah, I was covering screw holes that screws that weren't put in perfectly. And the, the melamine had cracked a little bit around the edge and it didn't look good to the customers. So I had to put a cover over it to cover a defect. I guess in reality, yes, that is that that is accurate. Yeah, it was uh, it was I was covering a mistake or something that was not very appealing to look at because maybe my craftsmanship wasn't at the highest level. <laughs> uh, so that was approximately it was the end of the 90s so that's more than 20 years ago nine, nine, yeah 97 97 yeah, it was in uh, yeah basically august of 97 did you have at that time uh, already that enthusiasm for that um lean innovation thing for that improvement did you know about lean innovation at that time well that's a great question and this is something that i talk about a lot when i speak all over the world and this is the point so you take someone like me who's naturally curious, who loves to experiment, who is OCD, loves organization, and you would say, oh, oh, Paul, you're naturally lean. Well, maybe, but not really. Because people who are highly organized, people who like to experiment, people who are always looking for better ways to do things, they're not necessarily lean thinkers. And this is the big deception that's going on. And this is what I had to be careful with with myself because I had all those attributes. What makes a lean thinker is someone who realizes that it's not enough just to improve and find better ways. But a lean thinker understands that most of everything they do is waste. A lean thinker understands that there are eight different kinds of waste. And those wastes are intersecting everything they do every day. So if you're OCD and you're always improving, you don't really understand lean. You don't really understand the depth of what lean is all about. You don't really understand that this word muda or waste, the Japanese word is muda. You don't really understand this little tiny word, M-U-D-A, packed so much power that it could literally rock your universe. Most people don't understand it. They, oh, well, yeah, there's waste. Oh, yeah, I'm getting rid of waste all the time. No, 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 you don't understand. That little word muda is so powerful, it's like a nuclear reaction. And the minute you understand that it's intersecting every breath you take, and your job in life is to eliminate it, so instead of getting one lifetime, You live 10 lifetimes. That's a lean thinker. Or you do the work of, of 10 uh, people uh, at the same time. You got it. So lean is really simple. Super simple. Really simple and super powerful. It's that little tiny word, but yet it's ba boom. It's massive when you really capture what's going on. Okay, but now you're talking about uh, at not at the end, but after more than twenty, twenty five years of uh, of a journey. Um, mm -hmm. What was the like the initial thing for you to look into? Um, Into the lean, in, in, what was that like? The, the was there some initial phase or, or spark for you? Yes, here, here, here's what happened. Okay, so I talk about this in my book quite a bit, but here, here's what happened. Essentially, you take someone like myself, who I wasn't a good student, and I, I really struggled in college. Even though I got straight A's, oh, I was just the dumbest kid out there. But the bottom line is, everything I did in life, pretty much, I was very successful at. 
I invested in real estate at a very early age. I became very wealthy at a very early age. I had a beautiful home. You know, I, I, I knew how to put one plus one together and make something significant. I was trained by Bob Taylor, the world-renowned guitarist. He's a very close friend of mine. I talk to him every, not every day, but I talk to him regularly, okay? And I've, I've been surrounded by very smart people. My dad was an engineer for General Dynamics, F, uh, cruise missile, F-111, Atlas Missile Project. I had a lot of people around me that influenced me to make me very successful. So you got the picture here. And then I went business of the year. And then I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. My company was very successful. I was like one of those guys you look at and say, damn, that dude's good. And then the Japanese came in and looked at my operation after I'd won business of the year. And the bank told me they would give me any amount of money I wanted because I was so good. And the Japanese said, you suck. Hmm. And then when I went to Lexus and I went to Toyota and I saw them, I go, I suck. Yeah. That's when I, re that's when the light went on. That's a very similar po uh, uh, story um, like Porsche had uh, in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, and is what was probably, was it as hard for you to hear something like that as it was for them? Oh, well, I wasn't as good as Porsche, so no, it was easier for me. It was easier for me than them. They're, they're world-renowned, acclaimed car manufacturers, so no, it was much more difficult for them. <laughs> you know, they had, a lot, they had a lot more history than I did, but I'm sure there was similar similar uh, difficulties that they had to overcome. Yes, they're basically just around the corner from us here. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I drive, I, just so you know, I... I Everything I have is Toyota. Even, even though I drive a Porsche, I have one Porsche, the most beautiful Porsche in the world, a limited edition uh, uh, Spider, you know, 918. It's outrageous. But the only reason I have that car is because it's a Toyota. <laughs> and most people don't understand that. Because yeah. Toyota helped Porsche rebuild and re. That's the only reason I, I never own it. I never own any other car because. Toyota's the best in the world. Well, Toyota came in, you know the story, with Porsche, yeah. and the rest is history. Now they build extraordinary quality. Okay, so if, if you complete that sentence, the Toyota production system is? The greatest philosophy of how to organize people and resources in the world. Okay. How's that? How's that? It sounds good to me. That's what it is. That's what it is. It, it's it's not the best car maker. Toyota is not the best car maker in the world. They're the best manufacturer in the world. Mm -hmm. And they're not perfect and they think they're terrible. And I work with Toyota. I'm in Lexus all the time in Japan. I'm in Toyota all the time in Japan. I work with the vice president of Lexus. They think they suck. And that's why they're so good. I think you have to have a certain um, being humble um, about what about your achievements, uh, and there's always room for improvements. If you understand something like that, it's, mm -hmm. it will get mm -hmm. everywhere. I think. Yeah, one of the philosophies, one of the principles from the president of Toyota is that the moment you think you're good, that is the beginning of yes. the decline. Yes, I, I see what you mean. I also see a, a lot of parallels between uh, like the production system or lean, um, which is very much oriented on organization and uh, manufacturing to the, the stuff that I do, which is like uh, focused on, on product creation, service creation, business model creation, uh, which has lots of overlaps uh, with because uh, there's organizational parts. Uh, you have to do continuous improvements all the time because and listening to the customer all the time, uh, else there is no innovation possible. Right. I feel a lot about these things and I, I'm using some of your videos uh, in, in my workshops as examples or show people, or tell people to watch that because you have such an intensity that yeah. helps people to understand these things quickly. Well, I, I'm intense because I love it. I'm intense because it improved my life. I'm intense because every day today I'm going to have a better day than tomorrow. So why wouldn't you be happy about that? What What system or philosophy can systematically produce that outcome. I don't know of any. 
Okay, but uh, see, you are very intense. At least uh, that's what uh, comes across in in the videos. Do people feel right. like Valium next to you sometimes? Yeah, 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 yeah. People, yeah, yeah, yeah. People, yeah, exactly. People get wound up when they're around me. Yes, if that's what you're asking. Okay, so yeah, like the fast fast charger, uh, also for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I and I like and I like that, and I enjoy that because when people are around me, people are you know people are hyped up, people are really paying attention, and I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, w when you have uh, uh, great ideas, or when you have a cause that you want to deliver and that pe want people to pick it up on it, uh, you have to be driven in a way. Is it uh, is it possible, or is it necessary to, uh, for such a drivenness to be? trained as a woodworker, have OCD, get a degree in education, uh, having worked as a minister and teacher, um, playing the guitar and stuff like that, um, to, to do something like that, to be such dri so driven? I mean, that's a mix of skills, a huge mix yeah, that, of skills. That, that is, well, probably just because everything fascinates me. I mean, er everything I look at, I'm curious about. I don't know why I, I just maybe because no one ever slapped my hand, you know, when I was trying to figure something out. And if people ever do try to slap my hand, I slap back because I, I think it's very important for people to experiment. So this is the culture that I've created at fast tap is everybody is running experiments all the time and nobody gets their hand slapped. Okay. It's very important. So we don't, I understood that my father and my mother allowed me to run the experiment. I'm very lucky. And so I allow my people to run the experiment. And anybody that kind of tamps that down or dismisses that idea, they're not going to be on my good side for very long. They certainly won't, they certainly won't last very long around me. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Yes, I understand. I've written a, a short list of 11 points uh, that hinder innovation. And uh, uh, what I did is I, I simply used all these uh, examples, all these sentences that you know, we have never done that before, uh, that will never work and stuff like that. Right, 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 right. Do you want to know the biggest thing? I'll tell you the biggest thing, Dr. Reichen, that, that, that in limits in innovation more than anything else. There's just one thing. If you were to get rid of this one thing, everything would go crazy. Ego. Ego, yes. I'll explain. So when when we're innovating here at FastCap and we come up with an idea, and, and my, let's say one of my associates, my engineer, whoever it is comes up with an idea, the very first thing that will come out of my mouth is, that's a great idea. I didn't think of that. Your idea is better than mine. If the leader always feels like they have to be the smartest one, they have to come up with the idea, you will kill innovation so fast. But we have fostered this culture where everyone's always giving credit to the other person. Mm. And it's just explosive. I've seen the video that you created, the who are the 2%. And, uh, right. and it has, I will link that in the show notes. Uh, I like that list. It, it is so perfect. But, but still, if you are, if you have, uh, if you want to do something, if you have to convince something, you have to be convincing yourself. You have to have some sort of ego. So that there's possibly some sort of balance um, between. Some sure. Well, I'm a very confident person. <laughs> you know, I'm very, I'm, I'm very confident. But I think I understand. I literally understand the physics of what happens both chemically, emotionally, psychologically, and physically when a human being hears the words, that's a good idea. And I will take my ego or my need to be the one and push it aside so they can see and experience that that element in life mm -hmm. you even take these things to such a, a level that you you use these uh, concepts and and 
just use that for private life, lean the a lean lifestyle. Let's put it that way. You even have mm -hmm. written books about it. <laughs> right. How right. to transform lean into uh, let's say uh, the private life. Right. Well, let, let's let's go back a little bit. So lean is not uh, lean is like the simplest concept of the world. If we want to just back out. Let's let's back out five thousand years. Okay. Lean is not something that's new necessarily. It is really what I call historical principles of greatness. These are the, this is the wisdom of the age, and it really is can be summarized with one simple concept. Mankind was made very, very special and unique. We have this massive computer up here, and this ability to solve problems and be creative which is very unique. There aren't any other species like us. And I, I believe personally that we were designed and made this special way. And our purpose was to solve problems and improve and, and understand and reason. And all lean is, is a focus on maximizing our purpose, our real design. So all Lean is doing is creating a culture or an environment where the very essence of why we were created is utilized and supported. That's all it is. It's such a simple concept. So everybody is an innovator? Everyone is an innovator. Everyone Oh my gosh, everyone. Uh, we have special needs people that work here. We have blind people. We have people who are quadriplegic. We have people that have uh, um, autism. Every last one of them are just incredible. Okay. Yes, yes, every one of them. And if, if you break this down, uh, this continuous lean process and uh, if you transfer that also to a continuous innovation uh, thing is what I understand from you is you, you do that in very very small steps so two second lean culture but two seconds every day is one of the most important things for you to fix what bugs you that's right we're just developing a habit we're just just like you get up in the morning and you walk into the bathroom and you grab your toothbrush and your toothpaste and you brush your teeth because that's makes sense to do that right but that's a habit or you get up in the morning and you make coffee every morning it's a habit all we want to do is create the small habit just like making coffee is a small habit or brushing your teeth is a small habit the habit of looking at something and saying how can i make that better that That didn't work very well. That bugs me. And then stopping and doing something about it. That's all two second lean is suggesting. Okay. I sometimes talk to to um, directors, CEOs, and, and they say, oh, now I have to invest time. People don't do their work uh, if they do something better, if they uh, make the, if they think about improvements. Um Uh, that's quite a, quite a bit contra it's, contradictory it, right now. Well, it, well, well, it's true. You do have to invest time and money in doing all this. But then, then this is the other distinct feature or characteristic of a lean thinker versus an average person. A lean thinker is long term. They think long term. They understand that th there's an investment up front, but in the long term, Things are going to be way, way better. And they are totally comfortable with spending money now, knowing that there'll be a perpetual or a return in perpetuity over and over and over again. They, they, they totally understand that math equation. But a lot of people are short term, you know, quarterly earnings, you know, all, all the other stuff. And I've got to look good for the board and all that. I, I can care less about any of that stuff. I don't, I don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. And especially if the argument is, it's two seconds a day. Um, I'm going to improve something um, that will over time uh, be an hour, save an hour, for example. Um, but uh, the investment is also very, very small. But in the end, after a year or several years, there will be huge, huge savings or right. changes. Right. So let, let, I'll, I'll give you what happened to me yesterday. So for the last four weeks, we've been going through a transformation here at FastCap. 
And I have spent, what, eight hours a day for four weeks. My time's very valuable, you know, trying to solve some problems. And yesterday on the shop floor at five o'clock in the afternoon, I was watching someone do something. And I, and all of a sudden I had an epiphany. I go, we don't need to be doing that. And then we ran a test. And indeed, the test proved out what I was saying. So I spent four weeks of my time, eight hours a day, trying to solve a problem. And yesterday we had the solution to the problem. And the, and the problem will increase productivity by 300% for 10 people a day. Mm -hmm. That's substantial. That, that's, that's staggering. Now, this is not from a neophyte company. This is from a company that, again, everybody comes to watch and learn from. This is from a company that's been doing lean, the Toyota production system, for 20 years. This is from a guy who, who works in Japan, who leads study missions, who works with the top leaders in, in Toyota and Lexus. You would think I would have had it figured out by now, right? Well, nobody's perfect. I, but, but that's how radical, that's how radical of a, of, a, of a transformation that can occur on a regular basis with everyone in perpetuity. Yes. I'm very it's much really, with you. It's really, sta it's, sta it's staggering. A matter of fact, I can't wait till the interview's over with, even though I'm totally enjoying the interview with you because I'm going to run out there and we're going we're gonna to start implementing it. You <laughs> okay. know what I mean? Yes. I'm so excited I can't even stand it. Yeah, especially if you, if you know that uh, it's going to help and it's going to be a lot of fun also doing it uh, and, and seeing right. the results. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. So let's hurry up. <laughs> no. no, 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 no. You know what I'm saying. I'm just saying yeah, yes. I, that's what's on my mind. And I can't wait to go out there and try it because it's going to be incredible. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, but that, that is sort of uh, uh, something that you are built on. And over time, you start collecting people around you that uh, feel the same or something similar, that uh, do something similar, that react similar. They, they are not the same. I suppose nobody can be driven uh, for this cause as, as much as you are. You sort of in, uh, invite these people into, into your company as visitors, as uh, potential, uh, um, potential people that work for you uh, or that participate in the company. Uh, and you even take people on, on large tours. You even have uh, videos taking uh, people on your tour uh, of the company. I've checked you had more than 600,000 uh, YouTube views for your production uh, tours. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. We have oh, oh, millions and millions of people have watched our videos. It, it's, it's incredible. And everything's shot with the iPhone. There's yes. no, we have no film crew. We have no video production. Everything is just done with my phone instantly. Boom, boom, put it up. It, 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 it's unprecedented what we're doing because it's so simple. I'm using these examples also. You're uh, not only a lean maniac, you're also a video maniac. And I think it's so important to document these things and uh, to quickly quickly uh, uh, sort of transfer these ideas and 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 stuff like that via video and uh, the iPhone is very very simple to use I use it myself yeah, all the time for everything I'm preparing an online course right now with my iPhone I have a very lean setup for the for the the podcast and stuff like that so I know that is important um, uh, oftentimes people don't understand that even when I'm showing them your example it's crazy because it's so simple Simple. The simplicity and is here, frightening them. But but here's the key in my mind. We should not spend very much time trying to convince those people. We should put the message out there and find the people that get it and spend all of our time working with them. Otherwise, we spend so much time and energy trying to persuade people And I made this mistake. I never do that. I just look at them and go, oh, you don't get that? Get out of here. Mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when you wake up, you know, when you figure it out, come on back. I'm happy to help you, but I'm not going to. You can't beat someone who's not hungry. Yes, I understand. And you're very so, verbal and open about that in the video. And I think that's great because very. that way you attract these people that are on that level that to understand the accomplishment. Right. Absolutely. And the beautiful thing is I have thousands of those people around the world. I mean, I can't keep up with the number of people contacting me all day long. So it's not like I don't have people that want to learn. There's so many people. So I focus all my time and energy so I not waste it on the people that want to learn and not on the people that want to tell me all the reasons why they can't do it. 
Okay, but you are a teacher. You're a, also a trained teacher, um, but you're also an entre entrepreneur. Uh, you're showing everybody the way your company works. Uh, so you're not afraid of competition. You're not afraid of losing uh, or somebody stealing these ideas. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not. I'm not at all. Because here, first of all, there are a couple things. People that would steal the idea don't have the right ingredients to compete with me, <laughs> right? Because my whole philosophy is to in get everybody's participation. People who steal other people's ideas are about themselves. They're not about everyone working as a team. So I'm not threatened by them, number one. And then the second point is the people who see me and see what I'm doing, they have a certain level of, of of moral perpetuity and character. And those people tend to be attracted here. So they're not out to be nefarious towards me. Does that make any sense? It, it doesn't. I fully understand what you're saying. Um, but uh, it's not that often that people are so, so, so open about their ideas, uh, about the way they do things and about their solutions. And because, because again, my, my I, I I approach life very philosophically. I'm not, I, I, I really thought deeply about what's going on in life and how the universe works. And I understand that you could, you could perpetrate all the evil in the world, but good prevails. And, 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 and it is way more powerful than evil. And so I, I choose to be on the side of doing the right thing and helping other human beings and helping them improve their life. And so far in my life at 59 years old, that's worked out pretty damn good. <laughs> did, did flying help you with that, uh, with that thoughts, with these thoughts? Well, flying, flying had such a huge impact on me in many, many ways. Number one, again, I told you I wasn't a very good student. And it really is a very intellectual pursuit. Flying is very difficult, the kind of flying I was doing. I was instrument rated flying at 29,000 feet. I, fly, I flew to Germany. I, I've flown all over the world. I've flown to Rome, across the North Atlantic three times. So the answer is flying developed my, my, my intellectual acumen. It, it developed my ability to be very precise and not screw up. Mm. flying also allowed me to see the world and there aren't a lot of people in the world i mean it looks like there's a lot of people in the world but the world is wide open i mean i i, I can't even tell you it's just so wide open people say we're overpopulated i'm going you're you're not a pilot because there's nobody the place is empty yeah. i mean it's just vast empty empty everywhere you know not to mention the oceans i mean But it, it, it make, makes you really realize how small you are and how insignificant we are. Mm. That's you're, my perspective. Yeah, you're, you're in, in close in that sort of capsule, uh, high above the ground. Uh, I remember uh, in my f private uh, pilot's lessons flying from uh, Oahu to Maui, and there was just oh, yeah. water everywhere around us mm -hmm. it was right. incredible and there was just a little boat somewhere underneath me which i circled around and it was mm -hmm. it was just a vast openness and which was very eye-opening to me uh, also i think yeah. that, that was very so important. you know exactly you know exactly what i'm talking about and i've just flown across the united states and just open there's no one and i'm just like it's just incredible It's incredible. Uh, I drove uh, across the United States uh, many, many years ago, and it was just cornfields uh, for a long stretch of the, str uh, the trip. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, certainly there are, there are pockets of, of, of density of people, and I'm not denying that at all, but it's just wide open, man. Okay, so you recommend uh, learning how to fly or at least using the Microsoft uh, Flight Simulator for, for having some ideas about flying? I think if you're if you take aviation seriously, I think it's one of the most wonderful things you could ever do in your life. It puts you in a whole different state of mind. And you know, because you're a pilot and you would probably agree with what I just said, right? You're not the same person after you've learned how to fly a plane. It's a different world. 
it gives you also a different sense of confidence about yourself, I think. Absolutely. So, but you need to take it seriously. I would never tell anyone to dabble in it. It's a very serious thing. It's very safe when you do it properly. And that's why I sold my planes and why I don't fly anymore, because I was flying two times a week, instrument rated in a very, in very adverse conditions, you know, lots of icing, lots of bad weather. And as soon as I started flying once every two weeks, once every three weeks, it became so dangerous. And even though I was very experienced with thousands of hours and, you know, blowing in the most difficult situations, 500 airports I've landed at, I, I knew, oh, I'm going to kill myself. So I sold the planes. Mm -hmm. So so flying is also about repetition of certain things? You have to, you? Be all, you, all you, you have to you be on it. You have to be very current. We call it as a pilot. You have to be current. You have to... You have to be very fluid because unfortunately, in my case, my plane's going almost 300 miles an hour. The second you make a mistake, it only takes two or three seconds for everything to pile up on you and it's over with. Mm -hmm. So you have to know what to do, when to do it. And you have to be very fluid and not like, oh, what, what do I do there? It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm very much with you. I, I had some of these similar experiences. Also, I didn't fly that much. Uh, and after I, I saw that it takes so much experience and keeping up with uh, new regulations and technology and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I quit because I didn't have the time to do it anymore. You, you, you're, you're, see, that tells you that's really the measure of your intelligence, because most people aren't smart enough to realize you know, this is really dangerous, right? Most people say, oh, I'm the ego. You know, because even people said to me, Paul, how could you quit flying? Everyone knows you as a pilot. You know, you're renowned for that. And I said, I don't care. I don't want to kill myself. <laughs> yes, uh, I see what you mean. Uh, it, it's also an ego thing. But I have such deep respect for the amount of diligence it takes to go on and get a master's and a PhD. It's, it's a big deal. So I and I learned also, just so you know, from my German culture, my German training, that the Germans revere the teachers. They have a the deep respect for teachers. So I, 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 I learned that deep respect for the, the, the professor, the teacher. And I, and I learned that from Germany. And so I, I always want to be respectful of that because I think it's a big deal. It is a big deal. Whether you say it isn't, it's a very big deal. Yes. And, but you also, you as yourself, you get a lot of respect for being a teacher coming uh, through a very intense school of uh, your manufacturing, your company, your entrepreneurial right. journey right. also, right. which makes it even more right. credible, I think. Yeah, I think I think experience is the most important thing. Ultimately, I think when you can marry good knowledge and experience together, you have the magical alchemy. That's very important to have good uh, good underpinnings and understanding of the way systems work, but then have it married with real world experience. And I think that's why I'm so passionate because I'm not talking to you as a theorist right now. I'm out on the shop floor doing this every day, and it's just the most incredible experience mm -hmm. to be able to do what I do. And it took me a while to figure out what is so special about the things that you your company does, what it manufactures. And and but when you when you look at it very closely, you find out that it is important that there is a measuring tape that has similar uh, some several things to. Uh, uh, adjust it or to put it on the on the wood or, or whatever so so everything uh, yeah, that you do or your company does is about nifty features and great time saving uh, uh tools right you got it exactly exactly we, we're just solving the things that bug us that's all we're doing you know you you put your tape measure on your side and you have to struggle for that split second to get the belt clip to clip so we put a thumb we put a thumb relief on there so you can just press that and it opens up every time mm -hmm. I mean, nobody nobody did it but we did it i don't know what everyone else was thinking <laughs> yeah but uh, i think that there's also a special way of how you create that okay the first things you you created yourself the fast cap as a as a major right. idea and you're still expanding on that as far as i can see um right. but then you started to ask your your people uh, for ideas they came up with ideas but you also put out uh, a a web page and you say if you have a great idea that would fit with fastcap submit this Bring idea give me an idea of it uh, we'll will yeah. we'll pro progress the idea together yeah well all day long i mean i deal with inventors all day long that's all i do 
I mean, it's just interfacing with these people all the time with their great ideas. I mean, we have a, I have a, a, on WhatsApp, I have something called a beta tester channel. And I have all these woodworkers from all over North America who are, who have become friends of mine. And they're also experts in their industry. And every time an inventor sends me a new idea, I give it to the beta testers and I ask them, what do they think about it? And so I'm just in total connectivity with my customers and the real world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very important. So you are connected to creators, you're connected with to potential customers, and they are open to you and help you with their advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so another big thing here, Klaus, that's so important is the, is the way people access me. So if you go on my website, my phone number's right there. Yes. I mean, my cell phone number. And no, I mean, we're a big company. We're in 40 countries. We do tens of millions of dollars worth of business. Nobody would, no president would ever put their cell phone on the website. I mean, it's just insane. But yet, I know I do it because I understand the principle, and that is I want to be in touch with the real world. I don't want anyone filtering anything from me, ever. Mm -hmm. So everyone can get a hold of me. So simply, nobody ever struggles to get a hold of you. Did you struggle to get a hold of me? No. It was easy peasy. It was pretty easy, wasn't it? Yes. And I, and I answered right away. And no assistant came, oh, well, Mr. Akers will talk to you and on you know this certain It's like, yeah, Klaus, what's up? <laughs> yeah, and you, you react right away. It starts uh, a conversation is starting right away, and it's very easy to start to get into that conversation. Right. And if it leads somewhere, that's good. If it doesn't lead anywhere, yeah, no problem. No that's problem. the end. And so, Klaus, let's go back. Let's try. Let's digress just a bit with that. So, the people that want to rip me off, do you think they have? Do you think they're doing this? Do you think? The people who want to steal my ideas are are that fluid and that open to new ideas from all these people. Well, it's, they, their system is ripping stuff off, off so they know yeah. where to check for new ideas, where uh, some like searching patents and stuff like that, and then ripping right. off the patents. That's their system. Uh, your system is different. Your system is being yeah. open, being open to this and right. starting a patent in process, uh, bringing that on the market right away and not wait for six months and stuff like that. Um, right. which I, I think so is uh, it, very it, important. Uh, it's just difficult to compete with someone that is that agile. I mean, I'm not saying you can't, but our agility, the speed, the fluidity in which we move is, is pretty daunting. Yes. And then if anybody ever did rip me off, which people have, we just, we just out innovate them so much that their products become ir irrelevant. Literally. We put people out of business. People have ripped us off. And then we've just so innovated so quickly, they just quit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the best thing, I think, uh, to do. But see, um, what, what you do is in, in this uh, situation also is that you create several win-win situations. Um, it, it's uh, for your company, it's for you, it's for the inventor, it's for the people working at the company, for the partners, for all these vendors that are connected to you, uh, for the customers in the end that uh, know how where to go for the good stuff. Right. So it's a it's a it's a network. It's a win 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 win. Whatever situation that was created, and I have a um, a theory about Westinghouse uh, and Westinghouse uh, sort of uh, performing over Edison, uh, using actually the same thing that you do uh, here. Um, okay, I didn't know that. Go ahead, tell me the story. Okay, uh, if we are talking about innovation and innovators and stuff like that, we always talk about Edison. We use Edison as an example. He has uh, 1,400 patents in his name and stuff like that. Um, and uh, we hardly ever talk about Westinghouse. His company developed AC, and I think uh, Edison developed DC, right? So there was right, right. Tesla, tes Tesla was Tesla was Westinghouse, right? Tesla was right. working with Westinghouse, and lots of other people were working with Westinghouse. So Westinghouse himself had like 500 patents or, or something like that on his name, but his whole network had at least 1,400 network uh, patents in in their name. And so what he did, he was sort of helping the others um, to do something uh, that he could do himself, basically. But he would mm. let them have the glory, let them have part of uh, the, the action and uh, stuff like that. I, I need to study that because I didn't know that. And that is powerful because that's exactly what my model is. Because think, ultimately, the philosophy, let's go one more thing. I was just going to say, the reason why I do that is because my target is to have a good life, to be happy. 
I'm happy when other people succeed. If everything is just about me and me getting all the glory, is that really happiness? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So great. Let somebody else get the credit. I don't care. Okay. And and since you made sure that uh, you have people around you that sort of uh, tick the same way as you, uh, uh, they sort of understand this message and uh, they pick up on their opportunities, uh, on the way to do something, on the possibilities to do something themselves in this context. Right. Yeah. Right. And ultimately, you know, the target is to make the world a better place. Who doesn't want the world to be more peaceful, more happy, more people getting along, more people collaborating, solving more problems so people can live a longer and more healthy and more prosperous life? That's ultimately the target here. And by spreading a philosophy that enables that and fosters that is very, very satisfying. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the cynics uh, would say something very, very different, but uh, it, it's sometimes very hard to fight these cynics or these cynical comments. Uh, for no, I ignore them. I ignore them. They've always they've been they've been. A, I'm a stu I'm a student of history. Th those cynics have been around forever, and they they always lose. Ultimately, they always lose. They they win it. They win short term, but they don't win the long term. Okay. I mean, you just got to look at the world today. I mean, would you? Uh, would you not take the world today over the world 200 years ago? Oh, I mean, come on. I mean, I mean th th we, we live in the most epic time. People say, oh, my gosh, we have all these problems. I'm going, you have no freaking clue what problems are. You need to read history. I mean, you were lucky if you lived to 30 years old just 80 years ago. Yes. And today we have the most advanced medicine in the world. They can do remote operations. People are living longer. I mean, we have uh, – uh, Capitalism and the free markets are spreading worldwide. The east, the wall came down. I mean, come on. I mean, it's just like, look at Vietnam. I go to Vietnam. You know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, we were battling and killing each other over there. You go there now, it's the most incredible example of, of uh, the free market that I've ever seen in my life. You know, I mean, it's incredible what's going on everywhere. Mm, there's chances not everywhere, but up. almost everywhere. There's lots of opportunity for opportunity also. Everywhere. Every, everywhere. Yeah. Okay, I'm with you. So the, so the cynics are, they're, they're, they, they, don't, they don't understand history. They're not a student of history. I'm a student of history. I mean, it's hard to go anywhere in the world. Certainly there's bad things going on. But there's a very important phrase, and this is, the where, this is really one of the driving things in my life. Compared to what? I learned this from Dr. Thomas Sowell, a professor from the Hoover Institute at Stanford. He's, a, he's an economist and he's brilliant. And I read his books all the time. And the big concept is compared to what? So, so you talk about all this stuff, and, but compared to what? Compared to 80 years ago? Compared to 30 years ago? Compared to 40 years ago? We're living in paradise. This is unbelievable what's happened the advancement of man. But yet you want to make it sound like we're a bunch of We're, we're destroying everything. Uh, you have no clue about history and what, what has transpired. Okay. So compared to what? I, I always uh, think that like dead trees and dinosaurs have really propelled uh, this, this, um, this development and this uh, good lifestyle that we're having right now. <laughs> we, need to, <laughs> we need to sort of uh, find new ways to decarbonize uh, yeah, and, and still yeah. keep the lifestyle. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. And we will. And we will. Be, because if, if people are free to think about and solve problems, we, we've innovated ourselves through just about everything that's been thrown at us so far. We'll work it out. I don't get all stressed out about it. We're, we're going to figure it out. But everyone wants to wring, wring their hands that we have all these. I'm like, Just give it just give it five years. You won't believe what will happen. <laughs> okay. So but but actually to say something like that, you have to be really, really crazy about the possibilities of big ideas, of, of knowing that big ideas can change things and, and or that people uh, really working on something can change can change things. So we're back to the crazy, I think. Yeah, I mean, but, but again, big what are what are big ideas though in reality, Klaus? Big ideas are just the the accumulation of small improvements. So every day Elon Musk wakes up and he makes he, all his thousands of engineers are making all these little improvements. And then all of a sudden he announces, 
We've got a new way to make solar panels. We've got a new way to launch someone to the moon. We've got a new way to land a rocket back on Earth. That isn't just a big idea. That's the accumulation or the aggregation of marginal gains. Mm -hmm. Every day, everyone working together to fix all these little things, and all of a sudden, boom, we've got it in front of us. There is no such thing as a big idea in my mind. It's really the aggregation of marginal gains. Is that... Uh, did that help you to train for stuff like your two-time Ironman runs to lose weight, oh, to get more fit and stuff like that? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, that's exactly how I did it. You know, when I looked at how most people train for an Ironman, I thought, I don't have the time to do that. But if I get up every morning and I do 50 push-ups or 100 burpees and I don't go to bed until I've done that, I'm going to be in a whole nother level of fitness than if I worry about whether or not I ran five miles, biked 20 miles, and swam one mile. I didn't even worry about that. I just focused on doing a, a minimal amount, and then if I could work in extra things beyond that, I did it. But And then the, it was the aggregation of all, the, all those small little, all those push-ups and burpees and everything I do. I finished two Ironman, and I'm an old guy. They used to be fat and overweight. You're such a video maniac that you post the videos of um, of you being a bit chubby yeah. and then being ripped. Yeah, yeah, no, big time. I want people to see what can happen. I mean, my transformation has been nothing but. I mean, it's unbelievable. I can't even. Well, I can believe it now because, to be honest with you, my transformation was so simple, health wise. Here's how simple it was. Stop eating sugar. Sugar's in everything. It's in salad dressing. It's in everything you put in your mouth. If it's got a package around it, read the ingredients on the back. Is there's sugar in it? So get rid of the sugar. So that was the one thing. And then start eating real fruits and vegetables every day. And that's it. Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. But you look at what most people eat. It's all crap, right? They're not eating real food. As soon as you start eating real food and get the sugar out of your diet, you get thin and ripped. It's that simple. So it's that simple. What made it's you? It's that simple. What What made you understand that? Was there something special in your life that said, "Oh, like a heart attack or something that changes"? A no. Lot? Well, when it, well, the story is very simple. I can tell it in 60 seconds. I had just done Everest Base Camp in Mount Kilimanjaro. I worked for a year and a half to get in shape to train to do both of those mountains. It was very difficult, and I thought, "Wow, I'm pretty. I'm pretty buff now. I'm pretty. I'm in pretty good shape. I didn't want to lose that. That. That." physical prowess that I just accomplished. And so I happened through happenstance to read a book called Eat, Sleep, Move by Tom Ross. I think it was Tom Roth wrote it. And basically he said what I just said to you. He said, there's sugar and everything. Stop eating the sugar and start eating real foods. So to recover from Mount Everest base camp, I went to Thailand for a week because it was so, if you read my book, you know, I had a, there's a big disaster at Everest when I was there, 50 people died in avalanches and stuff. And I got flown out in a helicopter from Everest base camp. So I flew out, I was out early, like five or six days early. I wanted to recover. I was cold. I went to Thailand. I read this book on the plane. And when I got landed in Thailand, I woke up in the morning, went to the breakfast bar and I only put fruits and vegetables on my plate and an egg, but I didn't give any sugar, no bread, not all the crap that everybody else. And in one week I'd lost like four or five pounds. And I go, I've never lost four or five pounds that fast in my whole life. And I go, maybe there's something to this. So I just kept sticking with not opening packages and eating real fruits and vegetables, fish, things like that. And I just kept losing weight. And I go, oh my gosh, this is like brain dead, simple. I just kept doing it. And the rest is history. Now you have even more energy uh, to be even more driven and follow more of what is yeah. driving you and more, yeah, more yeah. of what's your passion. Yeah, two or three X more. Yeah, because when, you, when you're physically fit and you're not overweight, oh my gosh, it's, it's insane what you can do. Not to, not to mention just the way people look at you. I mean, when I walk into a room and people see me as old as I am and I'm thin and I'm fit and I'm toned, they go, how the hell do you do that? Nobody looks like that at 59 years old. Well, you know, it's really simple. Is there an end for this, for this passion, for this drivenness for you? Is there something where, where you say, mm, I don't want to do this anymore? Is there a certain place where you say you want to stop? 
Not for me. My, my, my target is just to train up more people around me who carry on the vision. And so succession is, is, is really powerful. So I see all these people helping other people living a life that's full and meaningful. That, that's, that's my end game right mm-hmm. there. It's not for me just to sit back and say, okay, I achieved it all. No, I love being pushed. I, my target is to, my target is to ski when I'm a hundred. You, you were talking about succession, uh, and and what you're also saying is that you sort of trans you you build a a, a culture of lean, um, which could be trans, which is a culture of innovation in your company and in a network in people around you. You're picking up of things from others. You you're giving back uh, uh, to others. Uh, you're supporting them. Um, so you sort of you have shaped this culture. Um, right. Is, is that always the, the the job of of the the boss to shape the the culture of innovation in a company? Uh, 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 you know, the number one goal for the leader of a company is it's not the CEO. It's the chief culture officer. The, the culture is everything. And that is something that the top leader must nurture and protect jealously. Is there other people that are as crazy as you around in, in, in FastCap that, that will sort of uh, carry you on? Know, and- may, may, maybe not as crazy as me when I'm in the facility, but close. When I'm out of the facility, yes. <laughs> okay. You know? That's the honest answer. I mean, there are people very, very passionate here. There's no question about it. But when I'm in the facility, I'm kind of the leader. So, you know, they, that 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 kind of takes over. But they're all crazy and they're all doing it just like me. But as crazy? No, maybe not no. as crazy when I'm here. But when I'm not here, yes, they're, they're, they become the leaders and they, they become the crazy ones. You are crazy. What went wrong in your childhood? No, don't worry about it. No, it's a great question. What went wrong in my childhood? I think if there's one thing I wish would have been different. See, you have to remember my parent, my mother, very poor. Right. My dad was raised in a farm in Colorado, farmer, lost the farm. My mom was one nine, nine sisters, immigrants from from Greece, lived very poor, a couple bedrooms, nine girls. You know, it, it's difficult life. Right. And so what they provided for me is a solid middle class foundation to improve upon. I mean, to to go to the next level. So I don't fault them for that. But if I said If they did one thing differently, I wish they would have spent more time nurturing me, educating me, refining me, exposing me to to more things, to be more deliberate about the way they developed me. For what for where they came from, compared to what, remember, compared to what they had, they did a spectacular job. Obviously. I I, I would I would have loved to have gone to uh, a military school. I would have loved to have been gone to a refinement school. I would have I would have loved to to uh, been coached to go to Harvard. You know, I would have loved to 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 be involved in politics at an early age to be exposed to political people so I could understand that world. But they did with the means they had a very good job. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, Paul, we are you have you have uh, given so much of your time for this conversation. I'm I'm very uh, thankful for this. Uh, I'm very grateful for for this possibility. Um, I uh, to to sum up or to to end this conversation. I, I have some some questions. Uh, it's like from your own products. Do you have a like a favorite tool, a favorite product that you prefer over all the others? Hmm. Gosh, I'm just thinking I use them all every day. What, what is my favorite pro? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I had to think about it because I have 800 products. So I had to think about which one's my favorite Kaizen foam without a doubt. Kaizen okay. foam is the best. Yeah. It's so huge. It's the biggest selling product we have. And it's something that I interface with every day. 
and I interact. I mean, everywhere I go, it's in front of me. Everywhere I go, it makes my life easier. It's in my car. It's in the drawers in my office. It's in, in I don't have an office, but at my desk that I stand up at. It's on my scooter. I have it on my scooter for all my tools. Yeah, Kaizen phone, unimportant. <laughs> Uh, it really grew on me. Uh, it took me a while and, and watching uh, some of your videos to understand the, the Kaizen foam. But I think it's a very, very, very good idea. And in the end, I think it would be even better if you didn't need too much foam, but you had smaller cabinets. So uh, you, oh, yeah. that way you, it would be even more lean, right? Uh, but you have to, you start somewhere. You probably have you right, know, right, big right. drawers, and you start with the Kaizen foam. And at some point of time, when you recreate the facilities, uh, you you start uh, uh, including small. Well, cabinets. I think I think the beautiful thing about Kaizen foam is it actually is a reduction product because yes. in order to put everything in the foam, you have to lay everything out that you have, and you find out you have six knives and four screwdrivers and three pairs of pliers, and you really only need one. So you sort all that stuff out of it, and now you just have one of everything you need. So it really is a great elimination tool, a great reduction tool. I think that's perfect. So the elimination and reduction is a is a very good tool for you as um, um, in in your life. Do you have a, like a, another favorite innovation tool? Well, anything to do with the fast cap, the original product is really really cool because we use fast cap this this vinyl material with this really amazing adhesive for everything from making labels to uh, covering screw holes to putting striping on flooring for uh, i mean we use it for everything it's just it's everywhere okay and and to get to something like that uh, i i had to think that you probably like uh the morning meeting a lot uh to transform mm -hmm. things to to communicate and Uh, and have a, have a great innovation tool that doesn't take much time, but is really, really, really important. Yeah, the morning meetings, it's the, uh, it's the cornerstone of who we are. It's how we create this. It's how we sustain, this is very important, it's how we sustain this culture. Most people don't understand the importance of sustaining something. Mm -hmm. So anytime you start anything in life, It is a absolute total waste of time if you're not capable of sustaining it. So we started lean and we were not able to sustain it. It wasn't until we did the morning meeting that we put in place the habit that would help us sustain what we were trying to do. Paul, that is a perfect ending. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for taking the time for this conversation. Uh, good luck with uh, the next project you're working on right now. No, and yeah, you, I, I know wait. you can't get wag back. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. That's be great. Um, thank you very much. My pleasure, Klaus. It was a pleasure. I, I love how wide ranging the subject was and how long it was because we really got to talk about a lot of different things. So it was a, my, my pleasure completely. That was my conversation with Paul Akers. He's putting out there a lot of videos and books. I've posted links in the show notes. Subscribe to the podcast for automatic updates in your favorite app. And please leave a review at podchaser.com slash the 2.5. You'll help others to discover the show. Also check out listennotes.com, a podcast resource I have just discovered. Thank you to music producer Imex for creating the music for the show. My name is Klaus. The 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators is being hosted in Baden-Württemberg, Germany. Thank you very much, Paul Akers, for the time and dedication. Run the experiment. You never know what's going to happen.